Today's Animal Spirits is brought to you by our friends at Y Charts. Michael, when I go on Y Charts, I have my templates all set up. And the first one I see now, because I'm interested in this stuff, is real estate. And click on it, and also it shows you the kind of news releases of the day for real estate, what the different rates are, all that stuff. And the one that came up today was Case Schiller National Home Price Index has been updated through the end of December. Okay. Does so that include Oh, okay, December. So it does not include my neighbor selling his house. All right, go on. It's not not included in the data. That, that, that might change things. So it is showing off the highs going this the data goes back like uh 35 years or so. And we're now 2.7% off the highs for housing prices, which is actually That's the it? second largest. Yes, through December. So it's not that much. So this is national housing prices from the top. I guess if you wanted to include inflation, it might be a little lower. The funny thing is you can also look at national year over year. So you can look at both ways, just the, the drawdown. You can look at the gains. We're still on a year over year basis. Home prices were up seven or 5.8% last year. Actually, you know what? We had a bet on this, didn't we? Home price gains for the year. Someone's going to have to, mm. someone's going to have to remind us of this. I feel like we did a, a bet on this home prices being up 5% or more. Let's just, let's just yeah, I can't. Okay. pretty sure whatever happened, I won. Okay. Uh, anyway, you would hope that this would get a little better. We're going to talk about why these the losses aren't larger on today's show. If you want to learn more about finding these charts, all the other charts on white charts, go to whitecharts.com, tell them Animal Spirits sent you, and get 20% off that first subscription. Welcome to Animal Spirits with Michael and Ben. I want to start by acknowledging an anniversary Ben, you've been blogging for 10 years. Is that real? It's, it's hard to believe. Yes, I, uh, I had this marked on my calendar for some reason. So it was February of 2013 I started. Was it WordPress? Yeah, I, there was no Substack at the time. I don't think Medium even existed. I had to basically build a website myself. And I, I, used, I had help from some dude who was in my MBA class who said he could build websites. And I stole a header from something else and did a picture and off Where'd the name come from? I don't think I ever asked you that. You know, my brother and I always talked about people making mistakes with their finances. And we always thought like- Nerd just, alert. <laughs> yeah, it's true. But we'd always say like, just use a little common sense. And so common sense was always kind of the name that I was thinking about. And I don't, I I'd honestly don't know. I came up with it on my own. I tried 50 different variations and that's the one that I, that I figured. And credit to me for not- spending uh spelling sense c-e-n-t-s oh it's so true people in personal finance sometimes will do that and credit to me for not doing that so wait was your first post the one that you sent to josh no 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 i i, I did a, i mean no one read any of my stuff for a year probably. what was your very first blog post it was about personal fine i don't even know someone sent it to me actually it was just about it was kind of laying out what the blog was supposed to be and honestly when i started it i figured i'd make it like six months i i I wrote out a list before I started, like, I'm going to blog about these 50 things. And I assumed I'll get through that list and then I'll run out of stuff to say and that'll be that. And I'll have this kind of just sitting there if anyone ever wants to read it. That's kind of what I figured when I started this. And you were working at the uh, endowment at the time? I was working at the endowment. I think, I think I honestly was just getting a little bored. It was a good job and it was secure and it was interesting. But I'd been there for, you know, going on seven or eight years. I was starting to get, like, you know, just... I wanted to try something else. And so blogging was my way of like, all right, I need to do something here. And so you wrote a great post, uh, some of their biggest takeaways. If you had to, if you had to pick one, what do you think's your, what do you think's like the biggest lesson that you've taken away? Or I think the, the biggest one, if we're talking about people in finance is just putting stuff into plain English. That's the thing that really surprised me. I was working in the institutional field and I thought everything there was so complicated and my whole ethos was born on like, you know, it's investing is not easy, but you don't have to make it hard. You don't have to, you don't have to make it so complicated that people can understand it. And so the idea of putting stuff into plain English, I thought made sense. And the, the most surprising thing to me was after six or 12 months of writing, my biggest audience was financial advisors and they were emailing me and saying, Hey, can I share your post with my clients? And I was, and I was not in the financial, you know, wealth management industry at that time. I was working with institutions and it kind of like a light bulb moment for me, like, oh, people could actually use this stuff. If you, I was just trying to explain it to friends and family, and people in the industry thought that that was actually useful. And that, to me, I didn't even realize at the time, like, oh, this actually could be useful. Like, communicating with your clients in plain English makes a lot of sense because they don't pay attention to this stuff as much as we do. 
Well, congratulations on 10 years. It's pretty incredible that you're still pumping them out at the pace which you are. I feel like you're like you're only you're only getting started. It feels like you're like ramping up. We'll see. I, it's 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 one of those things that's just become part of my routine. And I I get I get a lot of like personal satisfaction of like putting my thoughts out there like for myself just to like organize what I'm thinking. Well, I have not been blogging much these days. I think doing four podcasts a week, I feel like I say most of what I need to say on audio. Um, But I did write a blog post while I was in Disney. Credit to me. That's work-life balance right there. Maybe this is a good segue to start the show. The, The TLDR of what I wrote is maybe a paradox that the economy is too strong to avoid a recession. So as listeners know, we were away last week, but prior to that, one of the themes on the show has been the resilience of the stock market. And it was really a narrative shift from um, avoiding a recession to the soft landing, to no landing, to, oh shit, wait wait a minute, wait a minute, things are, things are accelerating, stop, stop, stop. And so now we're at the point where the market expectations have shifted to the Fed has to maybe do more um, because the economy just is not relenting. And in some areas, it's accelerating. And so therefore, we are going to go into a recession. It felt like we had a little three to four week window there where inflation was coming down and it felt like, okay, we're almost ready to claim victory here. Like this is, we're going to do this. It's going to be smooth. And now it's, instead of people thinking we're going to overshoot to the underside, and things are going to slow considerably, and that's going to be the problem. The economy is stronger than people realize. And it all it took was mortgage rates going from 7% to 6% for the housing industry to activity to, to pick up a little bit. And people are still spending. And I don't know that anyone would have said a year ago, the problem in February or March of 2023 is the economy is going to be too strong, and that's going to be the problem for the Fed. And that feels like where we're at. Things are just not letting up. Right. So, so is the Fed is the Fed going to panic is something that investors are asking themselves. But we did say a couple of weeks ago that if inflation has peaked, it's not going to be a straight line down, right? right. It, that that wasn't the case in the 80s. It wasn't straight down. Um so there's going to be some fits and starts and obviously, you know, we'll see where this thing, thing goes, but the market is not n- necessarily expecting the Fed to panic. So, well, a month ago, if you're looking at uh, the CMA Fed Watch tool, which gives you market expectations of where Fed fund rates are going to be. A month ago, 0.3%. There was a 0.3% implied probability of a 50 basis point rate hike. It was 18% a week ago, and now it's up to 27%. So still 73% probability of just a 25. But now there's a question, is, is the Fed going to maybe overcorrect? I'm going to jump down to the inflation thing here. We'll come back to the market stuff. Did you read the, the latest Matt Klein one last week on inflation? I did not. He was, he's been one of these people a lot that, that saying a lot of this stuff has really just been pandemic stuff. And once that comes off, it's, we're, it's probably going to get back to normal. And he's saying all the data is showing that it's probably not going to do it. And his not whole, going to do what? Not going to get back to their 2% oh. target on its own. And his, he says the good news is that the humming economy continues to provide more opportunities for more people to produce more of the things that we need and want. The bad news is it seems increasingly unlikely that America will return to the pre-pandemic inflation rates without a downturn. And here's one for me that maybe you can back up with some Disney stuff. This was an interesting one from his piece that I, I just, just anecdotally, the 7% surge in spending at bars and restaurants not adjusted for inflation is the largest single one-month increase in that category since mass vaccination began in March 2021. This is one of the interesting things to me about inflation is that you would assume inflation and price rises would cause people to change their habits. Like when, when not, I go to a restaurant yeah. now, it's I, I notice that it's way more expensive. And I have a family of five, so that's part of it. But it, the, the bills at restaurants now for me are, are noticeably higher. But all, all of them are packed. And it's not like anyone is saying, geez, these restaurant prices are so much higher. Maybe I should just eat at home and not do this anymore. And no one seems to be doing that. No one seems well, to be changing their behavior because of inflation. Well, so the impetus for my blog post uh, was seeing the line at Magic Kingdom. It was madness. And to your point about things getting more expensive and people not changing their behavior, we're going to get into the Disney stuff later. I'm guessing for a family of four, it's you know in the neighborhood of ten thousand dollars. It's 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 a not an insignificant amount of money to take your family to Disney. There was one point where we were by the pool and there was like an ice cream dip and dot type of thing, and on the the. 
uh, label said $5. Guess what? They charged me seven. <laughs> did, and did I say, wait, that's over the line. No, I just, I paid seven bucks. Of course. Do, do you all, I mean, I, I think I said this when I went to Disney. Do you look around and go, how, how is everyone affording this? Like, are, are, how are these thousands and thousands of people all affording a $10,000 or whatever the bill is? Like, where do, where do you come down to that? Is it just, is everyone just taking out credit cards to pay for this stuff? Everyone still has, everyone's still employed. I, I guess that's it. It's, it's kind of like, yes, I'll, I'll spend the money now and I'll make it up for it in, in wages. I guess that, that's the, that's the, that's the. All right. Part. So, so back to markets and then we'll, we'll filter through the economy and inflation stuff. Uh, so Michael Sembalist, who does probably my, one of my favorites there. Yeah. It's one of my favorites. Did this great post, um, as he always does. And you one of the charts posts he, in uh, podcast form now. I'm, I'm a reader of, of okay. especially this I chart. I guess he does a lot of charts. Yeah. Uh, so he said, what kind of rally is this? And there's charts. Uh, this chart shows low quality stocks and okay. high short interest stocks. And Ben, I feel like Mr. Some, one of us called this. No, 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 no. <laughs> you, you, poo you're poo pooing it. No. And I, ma I maintain that the rally that we saw, I, I'm just giving you the facts via Michael Sambalas. These are just the facts. So what do you have to say for yourself? I, I said every time we have this happen coming from a bear market, the first stocks to lead the charge are highly shorted stocks and low quality stocks. It's always a junk stock rally. And uh, yeah, I, I guess we'll see. Here, here's what I wanted to ask you. I've got a few uh, questions to ask you on this show today. I've got oh, some, question, some trivia. Okay. All right. So what's your, I was looking at this the other day. What's your best guess for annualized returns in the S&P 500 this decade? So starting in... January 2020, what are the annual re annualized returns? So from 10 to 20? No, from, from the beginning. So we're three years in, oh, basically. Oh, 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 oh. What are the annualized so returns this decade? 20 and 21 were monster years. And then 2022 was awful. So 8%? Yeah. 11%? I don't know. 8.5%. Eight, we're basically okay. average. This, it's just, it's crazy to think we've had. Yeah, how the last three years? Yeah, average. They, <laughs> if you take the, the boom and the bust, put them together, we have average, yeah. basically. Okay. That, I guess that, that's kind of what happens. All right, good one from uh, Wait, Katie. Wait, I thought you, any, any more trivia? That was fun. I got more to come. Don't, okay. don't worry, it's, it's, it's in the die. Let's do this, do this tweet here, and then I got another trivia question for you. So you, you do the tweet, <laughs> and I'll, I'll come up with the tri trivia. All right, Katie Greifeld tweeted that the six-month T-bill T -bill is yielding 4.99%. The S&P 500 earnings yield is 5.06%, implying that stocks are expensive relative to bonds or cash. It's the narrowest spread since 2001. All right. I did some work on this because you and I have been talking for a while now saying, geez, these short-term rates are so high. Will that cause allocators to change the way that they allocate money? Will that impact risk assets? Will, will it start trickling down to short-term rates? So I looked at the history of T-bill rates, and the Federal Reserve has this data going back to 1934. Uh, if you want to check out further from me, I do a plug here. I did a little blog post on this too, but I'm just going to tease. Where can people here. find that? Where can people find your blog? Uh, something common sense. Uh, three month T bill rates from 1934 to 1920 or to 2023. 70% of the time it's below 5%. So right now we're in the upper echelon of, of yields for short term T bills. 61% of the time it's below 4%. So 30% of all years since 1934 have experienced a three month T bill. I looked at the averages per year, right? How often does it average 5% or more per year? That's happened in 30% of the time. Okay. What do you think the annual returns are in those, in those years, and it's 25 out of 89 years, that we average 5% or more on short-term T-bills? What was the annualized return for stocks in that period, in those periods? Well, did, well, was one of those decades the 80s, which were very strong for stocks? I'm, I'm not going to give you any more context. I'm just asking. What's the annualized return when T-bill yields have been 5% or above? Okay. Um, average. Let's go with average. Eight and a half percent. Above average. Eleven percent per year. In right, times but, when. Yeah, but 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 give me like why? Is there anything in the data that's like a big outlier? It's because it happened in the seventies, eighties, and nineties. So it's bad in the seventies, good in the eighties and nineties. Okay. The highest average yields for ten-year treasuries and T bills is in the nineteen eighties, but it was falling. It it's surprise. It, that number surprised me. I would have assumed. Now I guess you you would think. Okay, stocks are long duration assets. T bills are short duration assets, and 
maybe one of the reasons people take a little more risk when T-bill yields are high is because inflation's high, and they think they need to get even more bang for their buck to beat inflation. Well, I How's think, that? okay, that, that's, that drives, but we know that it's not, it's not the number, it's the direction. So I would bet you, because just because we did this work on inflation, that when interest rates are rising year over year, stock returns are way below average. Au contraire. I looked at this. I looked at Go the on. monthly and annual returns, and rising or falling yields, the, the returns are basically identical. Hmm. I looked at even monthly returns. If T-bill yields are rising or falling, the average monthly return was basically identical, like 1.3%. It's more... Again, rising and falling inflation that matters more than rising and falling rates. So I would okay. say I, I guess I thought they were the same thing. Surprisingly not. So I would say inflation is probably going to be more important than interest rates this year if we b- go based on history. I, I, I like you would have thought in theory, if rates are higher, that makes sense, but I think investors care more about inflation than they do about rates, which seems surprising if you're thinking in terms of like textbook knowledge. Huh. So Jeremy Schwartz did some work and said, actually, the real way to compare stocks versus bonds is not to use the earnings yield versus the nominal interest rate because stocks are a real asset and bond, you know, that's a nominal yield. So instead, compare the earnings yield versus the real rate using tips. And if you do it that way, actually, we're right in line with the historical historical average. So Jeremy so agrees with me. Inflation matters more than nominal yields, right? Yeah. So, but I don't know if in, if investors mentally adjust for real rates or if they just see the headline and say, "I just want bonds." I don't know. I think this is it's it's too big of a question. I mean, certainly, certainly, it would stand to reason that interest rates, risk free rate for six months annualized at five percent, has to be competition for stocks. How could it be otherwise? I yes, and then the the counter from someone would be. Well, yes, nominal T-bill yields are five, but inflation is still six. So mm-hmm. why wouldn't I go for nine in stocks or 10? So that, that's, that's the rub, I guess. But I, I don't see how you couldn't look at 5% nominal yields and be pretty happy about that with the assumption that inflation is going to fall at some point. And then I guess at that point, yields <laughs> fall as well. So that, <laughs> there's, the, there's your paradox. If, if inflation does go back to 2 or 3%, guess what? We're not going to have 5% short-term rates anymore. So I guess enjoy them while they're here and forget about inflation if you can. Just push it push it out of your mind. It's not here. Don't worry about it. <laughs> I guess. Um, all right. Paul I would, lo- I would love to see the annualized inflation rate from when I went last year to you this year for Disney. It's probably going to be 15%. Right? They can, they can name their price and it doesn't matter. People will pay it. I think a daily pass is like 165 Which doesn't even scratch the surface. When you put all the extras on top of it. You know, not everything was so expensive at Disney. I mean, certain things were certainly, uh, but like a bottle of water. Guess how much a bottle of water was? Dasani, by the way. Three bucks? Four bucks? Three seventy-five. It's not terrible. I mean, it's obviously, no. it's, you know, it's, it's ridiculous, but it's not egregious. I go to NASA Coliseum for the monster truck thing and water's like seven bucks. Yeah. We were uh, traveling, oh. we were traveling at an airport and- my, we were at Panera and my kids grabbed Fiji waters and just opened them. I'm like, no, 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 no. Because there's like nine, <laughs> right? My, my son Rob- just opens, opens it immediately before I even pay. Credit to Robin. We, she shipped snacks, like fruit snacks, goldfish, all the junk that the kids eat and bottles of water to our hotel. Not necessarily oh, to idea. like, not to be frugal, but just because we need, we need snacks. Yeah. Right. And like, why not get bottles of water? Um, Disney charged us a $30 handling fee to receive the package, which as a customer, I was annoyed, but as a shareholder, I like that. If I'm paying that, I want Mickey Mouse delivering that water to my room. <laughs> um, all right. So Paul Kodrowski tweeted, I haven't seen the data put this way and the state change in daily rent, uh, retail investors net inflows into the U S markets is startling. It trundled along trundled. That, that's a new word to me. Yeah. Never heard of it. It trundled along at around $300 billion. Then people got bored in the pandemic and daily inflows quadrupled and we've never come back down. So I, I made, I, I was definitely saying that investors, once they, if you come into the market as a gambler, you don't become unaddicted because it's on, it's on your phone right now. Robin and activity would suggest otherwise, but what do we make of this? They're not leaving. I'm shocked that 2022 didn't see this crash. And I, I see a lot of people say 
the the this market can't be this bear market can't be fully over until all of these investors capitulate. But what if they no, what if they just gonna, don't? They're not. They're not going to just go away for good, right? You put money well, you put money on FanDuel, you you gamble that money until your FanDuel account is zeroed out and then you probably go back again just like the blackjack table guilty you don't stop you don't stop gambling because you lost your first five hands in blackjack you go to the atm and you come back and play again right that's what i do i mean i'm every time my account goes to zero on FanDuel, i just re-up <laughs> and i think that's probably what's going on here and yeah i will say this this surprises me because it wasn't just that 2022 was a bad year it's that it was an awful year the stuff that people speculated on had a depression, basically. All these stocks were down 70, 80%. Crypto crashed. All their SPACs crashed. Options, you know, that they were putting on did horribly. So the resilience here does surprise me, yes. Okay, getting back to the economy. Stephen Geiger tweeted from the Cleveland Fed, quote, a deep recession would be necessary to achieve the 2.1% inflation projection. That's basically the TLDR. Why are they so hung up on the 2%? Why not? A, I why, not a, know because why not move the goalposts? We had two percent inflation in the 2010s, and no one was happy. What's wrong with three to four percent? I know they they probably say, well, we can't say that because that ruins our reputation. But we have all the all the stuff that people complained about in the 2010s. We have now. We have higher growth. We have higher interest rates for savers. We have low unemployment rate. We have plenty of job openings. There's no more. You know, we're not complaining about zero percent rates from the Fed anymore. Wage growth, especially at the lower end, is higher. Yes, we have inflation. That's the trade off. But if, if we just say, okay, fine, 3 or 4% instead of 2%, and we don't have to go through this deep recession to get there, isn't that a good trade-off? Yeah, I, but I do think that there's a metagame going on where I don't think, I think if I had to guess, they're less worried about their credibility and more worried about the market's reaction to them saying, you know what, we're going to go to 3 to yeah, 4. Yeah, they, they can't say that. Because if that happens and then financial conditions ease and loosen, then it just defeats the whole purpose of what they're trying to do in the first place. Yeah, I, unfortunately... All right, this is interesting. From Bespoke, natural gas prices are down by a record 79% over the last six months. There's no analog to the magnitude of the current decline as the largest six-month decline prior to this one was 68%. Unbelievable. I, I looked the other day because we, we came up on the one-year anniversary of the war in Ukraine, which is kind of mind-boggling to think about that it's still going on. And commodities, I looked at a bunch of different commodity indexes. There's, there's five or six of them if you want to look. They're all down since the start of the war. So we had the initial spike, and commodities have round-tripped and are down a year later after the war started. Pretty incredible. Things you wouldn't have predicted at the time. All right, here's another good one from the Wall Street Journal. This one was flying around social media this week. Uh, apartment rents fell in every major metropolitan area in the U.S. over the past six months through January, a that, trend that is poised to continue because we had the biggest delivery of new apartments in nearly four decades slated for this year. So 3.5% three lower, according to Apartment List. Nearly half a million new apartments are coming online this year as developers seek to cash in on higher rents that tenants have been paying. Who would have thought if you actually build more housing that, pr that prices would come down? This is, this is what we need in the regular housing market. Guess what happens? Housing becomes more affordable if they build more houses. Why, so why is this happening in apartments and not, and not single family homes? Is it just because apartments are more economical for them to develop and they make more money on them? Well, did you read... Con we're we're going to get to Connor's sense piece later about home builders actually being the only game in town because existing homes are basically frozen. People can't afford to move. Right. Right. If you're locked in at a three and a half percent mortgage, you're not going up to seven. That is kind of, that is kind of a funny way to think about it. The way that you said that you think as a home buyer, you can't afford to buy, but as a home seller, you can't afford to sell. Right. Cause you're putting, you're putting, you're putting, you're putting yourself into a worse financial position so by moving. You would, you would simply think, just if you knew nothing, you would say, all right, mortgage rates are at 7%. What are home builders doing? You would say, they're getting crushed. Au contraire, my friend. I'm looking at Pol uh, Pulte. I, I, I slipped that one in. That was like, I just inceptioned that phrase to you today. What? Which one? Au contraire. I what said it earlier. I, see, I incepted you know it into your brain. I just Leo dicaprio to you and, and incepted it into your brain. Uh, you know what? This is a great time to address the fact that the Wall Street Journal incepted rich session into your brain. So Ben, <laughs> so here, let me lay this out. So a couple of weeks ago, Ben said, Ben like made this proclamation that he's going to coin it. You know what? It's a rich session. The Wall Street Journal wrote about it last week and we got a lot of emailers saying, hey, they stole, they stole your rich session. 
And uh, actually, it turns out that Ben probably, and I'm going to give you the benefit of the doubt and say inadvertently stole it from them because they actually said Rich Session back in January, early January. So you stole it from them. I'm going to leave this. I'm going to I'm going to put this leave this one up to great minds think alike because it's not like it's that original Rich Session. But yes, uh, I think the Wall, Wall, Wall Street Journal they they scooped me on it. What do you mean they scooped you? They beat me. Someone someone. Oh, oh. Yeah, no, no, no. I'm going to say, say that you saw the article because you're a Wall Street Journal subscriber, as am I, and uh, you probably saw it and planted. It's okay. It happens. I, don't know. I thought about that on the fly on the show. I'm just I'm, – I'm leaving that up to great you minds th- think alike. You, th- you think you thought about it on the fly. That's okay. the whole thing. Okay. Um, just like you saying au contraire right now. I don't even remember you saying that, but yeah, you did it. You did it. So, But anyway, yeah, these, these, these – the stocks of these home builders look phenomenal because, again, the only option is new construction. Yeah, we're going to get into that, but I I think if I was in the market for a new home and I could I could afford it, I would I would build now rather than buy existing. I think you're going to get a better deal. Um all, all right. right, so so Ben, you you said like is one of the big takeaways that really you said my biggest takeaway from this experience there's still so much we don't know about how economic relationships work. I think that's probably partially true, more than partially. Certainly a lot of the, there's a lot of truth in there. But I still think that the pandemic and its aftermath just twisted everything that we thought we knew well, I think into a pretzel. The biggest one is inflation because that one goes even pre-pandemic because the Fed was trying to get inflation higher in the 2010s and they couldn't do it. It took the pandemic to get inflation higher. And I know everyone wants to blame the Fed and they were late and all this stuff, but it's obviously fiscal policy matters more than monetary yeah, policy Yeah, I was going to say, manufacturing a recession or inflation upwards or downwards with monetary policy – Probably doesn't work. Uh, who knew that all you had to do was send out, you know, six trillion dollars? Uh, that'll do it. So anyway, but, well, we, yeah, well, we started the show saying that the housing market is down two point seven percent. If you would have said interest rates are going to go to seven percent and stay there between above six percent for I don't know, it's probably been nine months now. Wouldn't you have assumed the housing market would have crashed or come down ten percent in a hurry? And it it's just it's sticking there. Well, in, uh, well, in certain in certain cities it is. Yeah, but. I just think that those the levers. If we're if we're in an economics class, where you pull a lever and this thing goes up. You so, push so this, Al- this thing goes down. It doesn't so work Al- like that. Allison Schrager wrote a post. There's no going back to the old normal, and she hit on this. I want to read this from her. Allison says it somehow became conventional wisdom that an aging population put downward pressure on interest rates. Yes, that this is me now. That was certainly the narrative. Uh, Okay, she says, the thinking went that older people facing a longer life expectancy save more and invest in bonds, increasing the stock of saving money, meaning naturally lower interest rates. But this never sounded quite right to me. I mean, haven't we undersaved and aren't we probably going to have to go into debt to pay for our aging populations? Additionally, as people age, they need to spend their savings, which means more bonds and less demand for them, increasing rates. Then the explanation goes, there are younger countries who will buy our debt, but this all sounds sort of desperate to me. The story now states that older people are unproductive, which will lower the marginal product of capital. Uh, another way of saying interest rates. However, that assumes there'll be no new technology. I think rates fell and kept falling and we needed a reason why. It just so happened that growth fell and the population aged, bringing this all together into a neat little story that infected every international organization and justified spending forevermore. I think there's a lot of truth in there. That makes sense. I always thought that the idea that wealthier, as societies become wealthier, their natural interest rates should go down because the economy matures. That was, like a, that was a William Bernstein point in his book, The Birth of Plenty, like how capitalism was born. He said, historically, that happens to almost every society. You start really high interest rates, and as you become wealthier, more mature, they go down. That always made more sense to me than demographics, but she, yeah, she, she, that's pretty good debunking right there. There was a, an article from the Federal Reserve Bank of St. Louis Title is a tightening monetary policy and patterns of consumption. And they say, the theory suggests that consumption should behave during periods of tightening monetary policy is not clearly observed in at least two of the first four tightening episodes in our analysis. So Ben, you asked earlier, why aren't people responding to different Fed policy, inflation, and maybe it's just not that simple. Maybe it happens on a really long leg, or maybe it just doesn't happen at all. Or maybe sometimes it does, and sometimes it doesn't, for reasons that we just can't know. I also think there's a big thing to this, the fact that I wrote a piece about this last week, that 70% of the, of the debt in this country is mortgage-related debt. 
And if you can lock that debt in at 3%, taking marginally higher rates in other stuff like credit cards and auto loans and all these things is not going to feel that bad because you have this one huge chunk over here, your biggest spending category locked in. If you have that locked in at 3%, eh, who cares if I take a 6% loan out on my HELOC? I got this other piece locked in at 3 So to the point about a lot of the, the, the debt being fixed, Savita Subramanian from Bank of America said the average maturity of bonds issued by S&P 500 companies is 11 years. So look at this. Long-term fixed, 78% of all wow. outstanding debt in the S&P 500. So you say, oh my God, rising interest rates are going to crush corporations. Well, yeah, listen, if, you're, if you've got floating rate or your uh, lower credit quality, absolutely. You are smithereens. Well, this other, this other chart here, interest as a percent of sales. Look at how low that is. So this is from S&P or Standard & Poor's. And again, it, it, as Ben just mentioned, this shows the interest as a percentage of sales for the S&P 500, and it's never been lower. Why? Wow. Companies gorged in 2020, 2021 in particular of lower interest rates. So, so they're this, good. This is, I know people like to say that like all companies are dumb and CEOs are dumb. I could do this better than them. The old Buffett line was always like, don't try to take out debt when you need it. Take it out when it's cheap. And companies did that. This was this was smart. This was like good capital allocation, right? Mm -hmm. By the way, is it is it a good thing or a bad thing that I I didn't read the Buffett letter this year and I I just don't care that much anymore. Is that okay. is that a good thing or a bad thing? Uh, I mean, I, I read a few quotes on people posted on Twitter. To, to I, me, it, I feel to like I've graduated, and I, I I can't tell if that's a it's good or bad for me. Well, I forget who said this. It's it's a good thing to graduate from your from your heroes and. Certainly, there are people that I won't mention who's who's I, religiously everything that they that they wrote. I would just drop everything and read it. And listen, we're growing up, we're maturing. I still read the Buffett letters because I like it. Like brings me it it helps. This sounds so ludicrous. It like brings me back to basics. You yeah. know what I mean? Just like oh yeah yeah it's it's not that complicated even though it is. But he makes it seem yeah. like and, you, and have, you I you would know, recommend you know, that you know what you you know what you and Buffett have in common. You can What's explain that? things very simply. Common sense. He, that's why I, I think for a young person, going back through and reading all those old letters, and you get them for free right on the website, is is very helpful. And I'm sure there's other places too that have probably taken out the best stuff. And it just it's yes, it's very helpful to do. All right, um, Fidelity is hiring four thousand new roles. How about that? Nice. We're growing. I don't know if this was a week that I was less tuned to the news. Um, but were there not a lot of layoff announcements this week? Because our layoffs, doc, our layoff you know, section is pretty, pretty. I think empty. it did. I think you did pick a good week to call it for, to call it off a week. It felt like it was a pretty slow news week that you took off. Were you not paying really? attention to anything at Disney? I thought. Oh, so. I was on my phone the entire day. Oh, I don't. Oh, okay. <laughs> well, I guess you're sitting in line. <laughs> if you're sitting in line for an hour. You have you have time to do that. But it uh, didn't feel like a slow news week. Okay. It felt like the market a, was either down or fading every single day. It felt like the narrative changed last week, actually. Yeah, it did. I also think sometimes people are just looking for an excuse to sell. I, I just, you wrote a post about this a month ago saying that, like, don't get caught up in the, the narrative vortex of the change. Like, well, so here, it, you're it's right. changing here's the on a thing. constant basis. Constantly. And here's the other thing. We, were, we kept saying, like, why are stocks so strong? Why are we afraid to say it's a new bull market? Which, you know, my bad. Um, but, all right, we had a 5% pullback. <laughs> yeah. Like, and and I, I don't, in this case, I don't think we're trying to over-explain or over-engineer an explanation. I think it's pretty clear. Like, the, the data is too strong and the market is reacting appropriately, in my opinion. Um, this is from Torsen Slock, I believe. Uh, the consensus, he's showing uh, NFP, non-farm payrolls, better than expected, getting back to the strong economy. The consensus has been systematically too bearish on the economy for the past 10 months. This chart goes back to 1998, and that's a record. You would think that the, 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 whoever puts out these estimates are catching up, and they're just not. So th this is probably one of the other things that this caught the most people by surprise is just the labor market just continues to be strong. Like I said, since the Fed started raising rates, from 0%, the unemployment rate is down. And it's gone basically from 0 to 5, and the unemployment rate has fallen in that time. Yeah, pretty wild. All right. Wait, I think we got a lot of stuff on real estate. Uh, Rick Palacios Jr., total number of realtors falling for the first time in a decade. Ticked down a I little bit. I have to correct you. I'm sorry. I'm sorry. It's realtors. What did I say? Say it again. Realtors? No, you say realtors. Realtors? Oh. It just I think sounds it's common. It's a, it's, yeah, it's a common. People say it's kind that. like nuclear, nu nuclear, nuclear, nu nuclear. Nuclear. No, people say that. Yeah, people say that wrong. Uh, my, my least favorite one is 
Chipotle. Oh, it's awful. I can't. I can't handle. I feel I like the average Chipotle. the average age of people who say Chipotle is what forty. Now I would say forty nine. It's not even that old. Fifty three, fifty eight. Do you do you sometimes find it with your kids that you find it funnier when they say things wrong so you don't correct them? Oh my god! So Kobe has not bad speech issues, but he's in like he's in speech, uh, speech therapy, I guess. Um, and there's a book called No David. Which do you know that book? Mm-mm. It's it's great. Uh, it's a great book. And I was reading it in Logan's bed last night and they both say no David, but Kobe calls it David. Okay. <laughs> and Logan was getting so mad. Logan's like, it's not <laughs> David. And Kobe's like, I'm saying David. <laughs> and like, it was just like, it was hysterical. My, so yes. daughter, my daughter, Kate, she puts a D in front of some words that don't have. So she, instead of saying remember, she says demember. And my wife and I oh, crack up every time. She says, do you guys remember? And we crack up every time. And I like don't want to, I don't want to correct her about it because it cracks me up. All right. Uh, by 2020, the number of realtors surpassed the number of homes for sale. We, we talked about this. Uh, now it's fallen from 1.6 to 1.5. So it's fallen a little, not that much. But so this is surprising to me. The, the typical realtor in the U.S. has eight years of experience, works 35 hours a week, and earned a gross income of 54320 in 2021. Uh, according to the NAR. I think some people think this is going to be easy work. I sell a few mm. houses. The commissions are big. It's uh, it's probably a power law thing where the top 5 or 10% of them make most of the money. I also but, do wonder how many of them do it part-time. I, I'm sure a lot of people. And I'm sure in the, in the pandemic, a lot of people thought like, oh, yeah, this is a part-time gig. I'll just pick it up. And most of the people who pick it up part-time probably end up falling by the wayside eventually. Although they do say the typical realtor so that would, you know, I mean, average to me has eight years of experience, oh, 35 true. hours a week. It's a lot. It, yeah. The other thing is, it's not like you're working nine to five hours. You're working on the weekends. You're working probably at nights when people want to see houses. It's now I, I, I'm, I'm anti-realtor. I sold my apartment by myself. If I ever sell my house, no offense, I'll probably do it by myself, but I get it. It's a, it's a, because from, from the seller's point of view, it's like, wait a minute. Why am I giving them this person 3% to open a door? Listen, it's not like- I used I used to be like that. I've had two good realtors in the past seven years, and I found them both very helpful in like the back and forth and the negotiating the contracts and stuff that they handled. I thought they were worth the money. I used to be in your same boat, and I, I, I think in New York it just costs way more, but I thought as far as I was concerned, people who did it for me were very helpful in the negotiating process and the back and forth, handling all the behind the scenes stuff. And yeah, yeah. I'm not, I'm, like, not, I'm not trying to, to shit on realtors. My point was though, it's a super hard job. And the reason why the commission is what it is, is because they got to eat, right? Yes, it's, it it's takes, hard. It takes time to sell a house, right? Yeah, it's, it's not like yeah. you sell houses on day one, like we did during the pandemic. That's, that, right. that's not normal. Right. Um, so yeah, so my, my neighbor sold his house. I see it on, on Zillow. Uh, you know, the last price cut was 290 and I asked why, and somebody said just so he could like get back to the, you know, spur activity. And it uh. says it's it says it's pending, although I don't uh So this is oh, why you need a Oh wait, it says re- this home has a pending offer. Oh, interesting. But well, that doesn't mean anything. This is why you need a realtor in your life so you can ask them what did it actually sell for. A pending offer? That means nothing. All right, so maybe I jumped the gun on that. We'll see. Ben, we 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 uh Wait, you 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 forgot to tell us the biggest thing about that's happened to your life in the last three weeks. You finished your mudroom. You sent us oh. pictures. You finished your mudroom. <laughs> did we speak? I don't know if we spoke about this. Maybe we did on the previous podcast. So forgive me if I'm re- repeating myself. But when we were in Miami, like everybody who came up to me said, "How's the mudroom?" Yeah, <laughs> and credit to Robin. That's a it's, it's a good mudroom. It's a mudroom pot. So she she did the design and everything. It looked nice. Thank you. Yeah, no, she did, she did a good job. I mean, um, kids have kids have so much. We talked about this before. Kids have so much stuff. My kids come home and they have their backpacks and their snow bags, and you need that kind of stuff. You need a, yeah. like a locker for them yeah. all. Uh, ben, we have been on the right side of this, I believe, of why starter homes don't make sense. But the angle that we were taking was moving, and all this. It's 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 stressful. It's time consuming. It's expensive. Right. Um, one thing that we didn't consider was interest rates could go from three to 7%. We were definitely, we were definitely in the, maybe rates are going to stay low forever camp. I'm not afraid to admit it. That, that, I, w- I said that. We definitely said that. That's one of the things we were wrong, but there was no one, not one person said mortgage rates are going to 7%. Well, of course, this was obviously pre-pandemic. But, uh, but anyway, one thing that we didn't consider about why starter homes don't make sense is if, you're, if you got into a starter home 
in 2020 or 19 or whatever. You're staying. You're stuck. Yes. You're going to add a bedroom. You're going to add a deck. You're going to fix it up. You're, you're not, yeah, you're not going to sell it. So we spoke about U.S. existing home sales just completely collapsing. I think it's 12 straight months. I think it might be a record of declines. Uh, the, so, so U.S. existing home, this is from the journal who Ben likes to steal stuff from. U.S. existing home sales in January by price change from a year earlier. So a million dollars and up, down 40%. Oh, wait, what is this showing? This is this is not price change. Oh, I'm sorry, by price. My bad, my bad. So home, so homes that are a million dollars, those US assistance home sales are down 40% year over year. So they're not selling. No, you can't. It's too expensive. Which is, which is also interesting because you think if people are paying five or ten million dollars for a home, some of those people are buying in cash. And that yes. rates shouldn't matter there, but yeah, that is so Apollo had. They, they have, Apollo has some graphs. They show the housing inventory decline, which it, it bumped up when rates went up and then it just is crashing again. And they're also showing that the number of days the house is for sale has gone up, which makes sense. Lance Lambert, mortgage purchase application index is at an all-time low going back to 2000, meaning there are no mortgages being originated right now. This, I guess, which makes sense. How long do you think- Imagine being, imagine being a mortgage broker in 2021, having probably the best year of your entire career. To uh, ninety percent drawdown. I mean, awful, really tough. Do Do you think we get a pre pandemic housing market coming back, or are are the demographics and the the changes that we've seen just enough to just are all these numbers going to stay low for like the next decade? Which numbers? Just the activity staying lower. Like, is is this going to be a one time three percent mortgages are going to be oh, hanging so. over the housing market for a decade? Well, oh, I see what you're saying. I still think the structural imbalance between more buyers and sellers is real, but with mortgage rates at seven percent, it just you're frozen. Yeah. And then people, every time we talk about this, someone says, "Well, people get married. They there's death, there's dying, there's divorce. These things, and obviously there's still transactions. Yeah, of happening, course, well, but, it's but yeah, so just, just down forty, just down forty percent. Yeah. Uh, here's from Home Depot CFO: the housing, the uh, renovation boom is still intact. They say, let's see. 90% of homeowners either own their home outright or have a fixed rate mortgage under 5%. And so they're saying for them, that is just, that's great. Home Depot, we love it. Renovation boom is going to continue. And that that makes, especially when you consider how much equity people have in their homes. That's what I said. Even if your home equity line of credit is now 7%, you would rather take that equity out of your own home and redo it than you would probably take out a new mortgage. No doubt. Um, where are we? Oh, I uh, speak. You, we talked about yeah. housing, so I, I did a let's do a great quarter, guys. Because okay. I actually I finally listened to my very first live quarterly call. Someone was posting quotes from the Toll Brothers call as it was happening on Twitter, and I said, Oh, wait a minute, let me pull up quarter. You can now listen to live calls. I listened to the Toll Brothers call for the first one, and they had an interesting point about people who build new homes. And he this is from their CEO the buyer doesn't have a mentality of I'm locked into this six and a half percent rate for 30 years. Refis happen all the time. Our buyers are sophisticated. They know for two, three, four thousand dollars, they can get out of a high rate and get into a new low rate. They want to get down. They don't want to get out of their lives. They took eight months off. They're now sensing some urgency. And I'm not saying rates aren't important and they don't impact affordability. They do. But for our business model, it is not the number one thing. And Axios had this thing saying that part of the reason that these home builders are doing so well, Pulte's offering 4.25 percent. Uh, Lennar is offering 5% for mortgages. 75% of builders are dangling mortgage rates that buyers can't find on their own through lending. So wait, so, so, so the home builders are doing mortgage origination now? They're paying, no, they're, yes, and they're, they're paying down rates for the buyers. So they're- What is that, how? They're so paying the of, bank? Yeah, so you can pay points. You pay more money at closing and you can get a lower rate. Uh, you, could do, you could do that now if you wanted to. So instead of lowering their prices substantially, they're paying down the mortgages for people that are offering huge incentives because the we talk the, the home builders need to get that inventory off the books, right? They need they need activity. They need this stuff, they need the stuff to keep going. Interesting. So that that's why if I was in the house if I was in the market for a house right now, I'd be talking to a home builder. If I could afford it, I would not be looking at an existing home. I'd be going to many home builders and finding places where I can build a new home and negotiate with them and get some incentives. Survey of the week comes from Coinbase. Uh, and they say, according to their, their study, more than 50 million Americans own crypto. 
or 20% of the adult population. At first, no, I thought this was no crazy. No way. No way. So I think this might be this might be overestimating it by 2x. 4X. I don't think it's completely egregious. You think only... 50 million? There's 300 million people in the country. 330 million people in the country. Well, it says one out, of, crypto, one out of... Bitcoin one out would be of, at 200,000. One out of every five adults. I'm going to say one out of 15 adults. Maybe even one out of 75 adults. I don't even know. Yeah, I don't know. 50 million is a lot. That's a that's taking a wild leap from the survey. All right. Well, they say, I agree. They say one out of five. So what do you say? I'm going to say... One out of 20. One out of 20? Five percent. Even five percent is a lot. Five percent is probably all right. Five or 10 percent. Yeah. I guess we'll never know. All right. Let's get into some auto stuff. Some 9.3... Wait, we should know because crypto is supposed to be so out there for everyone to know, right? The addresses, someone someone can look at all the addresses for us and tell us. Yeah, but there's a lot of chicanery that goes on with that. True. Uh, some 9.3% of auto loans extended to people, this is from the journal, uh, with low credit scores were 30 or more days behind on payments by the end of last year, the highest share since 2010. Now, these are for subprime borrowers, those with a credit score of less than 660. So that makes so if sense. So you, if you look at, they have another chart, if you look at subprime delinquency rate by credit score, it's really people that have a credit score of 300 to 530. You know, at that point, it's like 25% delinquency rate, which is high, right. but that's that's a very low credit score. But I don't you, know how many you, people this represents. You probably build that in for low credit scores, right? Yeah. Uh, they're going to have, so if you look at, the New York Fed puts out this thing on credits every, every, uh, every quarter and they did percentage of balance 90 plus day delinquent by loan type, credit cards, student loans, auto loans, mortgages, and home equity. And auto loan is basically steady over the last 10. I mean, it's gone up and down a little bit, but it's, it's not looking terrible yet. No, it's at an all time low. Right. I mean, no, maybe it's, it's ticking higher. What? Yeah. Oh, my not bad. My bad. I'm, I'm looking at mortgages. My bad. Yeah. But still, so, yeah, no, you're right. Auto loans look, look pretty healthy. So anyway, car dealership guy said, American Car Center, a 50-store subprime dealer group, just went under this morning. No pre-warning or anything to customers or employees. Um, he also predicted, this was back in December, that used car dealers will shut down in 2023 at the fastest pace since 2009. Uh, so there you go. This was this was pretty insane. He also tweeted. Um, just, just because uh, the activity is so low or what? Because prices are too high and people aren't buying used cars anymore or what? Or they're just not I don't know if it's because uh, credit is deteriorating. I, I don't know. I, okay. I don't know. Uh, woman goes viral for buying a 1998 Ford Escort for $289 <laughs> a month. Oof. For 84 months. Oof. Ouch. You know, we when we went to Arizona for a little four-day getaway for like midwinter break. These kids have so many breaks now. Uh and we went to Phoenix, and we rented a car, and they didn't have an SUV, so we got a sedan. And we, I was driving, like, a Nissan Altima. And, man, do I miss driving a sedan. Do you know how much gas mileage those things get? I know SUV and truck gas mileage has has improved, but we got, like, 500 miles to a tank of gas in this thing. It's like driving a little go-kart. Like, ugh, I, I wish I could drive a sedan. I just need, like, a six-seater sedan. Like, just make it a lo- like a limo. I need a limo so, or something. Well, when we when we – took a car to the airport we were in i don't know if it was like the suburban like the extra long one but it had it had like the two like pilot seats and the third row behind it which is way easier than having the second row like flip over yeah you know what i mean yeah that was very nice but those cars are so uh the grand wagoneer somebody a car dealership guy tweeted this one hundred eleven thousand dollars. hello <laughs> that's insane what is the payment on that thing? Honestly, is that two thousand dollars a month? I have no idea. That's all. I I can't believe that. Maybe maybe the Fed should do fifty. I guess so. Gambling in the U.S. reached a record high last year as commercial casinos and online betting apps reaped more than sixty billion dollars in gambling revenues. This seems like the kind of thing that's just going to go up every single year. So so here's an interesting quote talking about like people's behavior. Somebody said the surge in gambling was initially attributed to people having economic stimulus money, but I think it's hard to make that argument now. Yeah, I think so. Uh, across the U.S., gamblers lost thirty-four billion dollars in slot machines. Ugh, How is that's that so possible? painful? That's if you go into the casino to each their own. But the slot machine thing, I will never get it in a million years. 
Players lost I, ten billion on table games, up fourteen percent. Sports betting generated a record seven and a half billion for more than ninety three billion dollars in wages wagers on sporting events. Not bad. Uh, so the Super Bowl broke, broke records is is the headline. We know that. Okay, that's going to happen every year, probably. Every year. All right, is this your first Carl Quintanilla tweet from this week? Uh, Took a while. You know what? Let's. Uh, well, we just discussed this. This is from Bespoke, just showing retail sales by category. Bars and restaurants up seven percent month over month. That's insane. No. Yeah, that that's in the January decline one. Yeah. People still is that, is there some seasonal things there? Do people like? But it wasn't even cold in December. At least not where I am. Every time I go out to eat, the restaurants are packed everywhere I go. All right, should All we right. do Disney, or do you want to talk about this first? Mm. What is this? We can uh, we can skip this. We've talked about it before. Go to, let's All right, so I, I took notes. I want to thank Michael Antonelli, who is a great person. His email was so helpful, wasn't it? So well, I, I yeah, uh, I wish I read it. Personal consultant too. Yeah, I was basically texting him the entire not the entire time, but I was texting him a bunch. So. Um, Michael told me to get these Balega blister resistant socks. <laughs> That's such a dad move. Uh, I guess, so they're socks. they're expensive. They're twenty bucks. I got four of them, and I got to say, incredible socks. B a l e g a, incredible socks. Absolutely incredible. Best socks I've ever worn. Uh, all right. So my my overall take from Disney, and I've got I've got a whole bunch of notes. It is an it is a premium experience like no other. So, for example, the wristband thing, right? Isn't that amazing? Ah, uh, forget about it. Incredible. So, when you go to like Six Flags or any other park, there's no like, there's no. I mean, maybe there are people sweeping up, and there's no places to park your stroller. At Disney, if you put your stroller someplace that's not supposed to be, they move it over to the stroller area. Yeah, they thought things through there. It is just so clean, and you know, you really do pay for what you get, or you get what you pay for. It's the most magical place on earth, right? Well, that's for sure. All right. So in the in the hotel, I noticed something. Uh, tip top cocktails. You ever hear that thing? No. You're not really a cocktail drinker, but they have these little cans of cocktails. In your room? No, no, no. At the, at the, like the convenience store. Oh, okay. Well, they had like old fashions, margs. Oh, pre-mixed drinks. Okay. Yeah, it was, it was, it was pretty good. Got not a few bad. of them. Effective. Okay. Um, you, you kind of have to drink to make it through Disney, I think, as a parent. Especially with, Ep- with Epcot. <laughs> yes. Uh, so, the first, so the first day that we got there, we got there on Sunday at around noon, and we did Animal Kingdom right away, which was great planning by the person that helped us plan it, because Animal Kingdom is not a full day thing, right? There's just not a ton to do there. So we spent half a day there. The, that's where the Avatar ride is. So, Ben, you mentioned the wristbands that get you in faster. Avatar had a 215-minute Wait, jeez. So it's like three and a half hours. So you buy these these Genie Plus Lightning Lane wristbands where you could book two trips at a time and sort of get get ahead of the line. For the first time ever, to the point about the economy being too strong, they sold out. That's crazy. They sold out. So the next day we went to, we did Epcot, which was incredible. The drinking, the countries, the rides. Epcot really is an adult place. It's not totally as much for kids as it is for adults. Not really. Totally for adults. So then the next day we, we did Magic Kingdom. And we bought, a, we, we got a, a guide. Now, Disney sells guides that are six to $700 an hour. And it's a minimum of eight hours. So it's like six grand. Jeez. We paid this guy for the same service. We paid him $200 an hour, which is still an insane amount of money. But I have to say, Magic Kingdom was absolutely swarmed. So this guy like got on lines for us, got us uh, food. If Logan couldn't go on a ride, he stayed with he's Logan. Like, he's like your own Metaverse avatar. Yeah, he was great. It was it was obviously ludicrously expensive, but uh, if you could afford it, it was definitely worth it. So he he, he gave gave me some good intel. Give me some good intel. So Epcot, hundred thousand people capacity. Okay. Di- uh, Magic Kingdom, sixty five thousand. Now, I'm going to ask you a little trivia, Ben. 65,000 people in Magic Kingdom. You've got these two-hour, three-hour waits all over the place. How many rides, how many riders are in the park? 
Wait, what do you mean? Out of that 65,000, how but, many people ride the rides? No, I'm sorry. How many available rides are there at one time? How many available seats for rides? Oh, geez. So there's 65,000 people. How many rides go at one time? Or how many, how many total people, How many people could be on a ride? Yes, I'm sorry. That was very confusing. 800, 850? 2,200. Okay. So 65,000 people Ooh. and only 2,200 riders at a time. Nice little business. Yeah, geez. Nice little business. So I, I was, I, I noticed a lot of uh, Bills fans. Bills fans travel well. Okay. Just an observation. I also noticed a lot of LSU people. So I said, I, I tap one of them on the shoulder. Is there like a game here or something? What's going on? Apparently they travel from Mardi Gras to Disney. <laughs> okay. Just keep they the were party all going over the place. Right. Uh, one night, I, I'm, get, I'm just going through my list. So forgive me. One night, uh, we were in the hotel, turned on the TV and I saw, oh, True Blood. Remember that show? Vampire Bill? Mm -hmm. Whatever happened to that guy? I, I, I watched that show. The first couple seasons were pretty good. It Amazing. Tailed off, tailed off at the end. Yeah. So I just want to you know, give a shout. How about my thing? Why did they not have Disney Plus in all Disney resorts? Yeah, that's a great question. For free. It's crazy. Uh, the True Blood, the opening song is one of the best songs of all time for an opening show. Yeah, that was. It was a really weird intro as well. Yeah. Great, 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 great you know tune. Not and then, to and then, not, to, not to overtake your Disney stuff, but at our hotel, we had really spotty Wi-Fi. I could not get good internet access because my computer didn't work very well. And they, so there was no streaming on our TV. It was just like the 60 channels. It really made me appreciate streaming and the ability to just find something on demand. There was nothing, like trying to watch something that's already started 15 minutes ago. What am I? Schmuck? Or, by the Come way, this whole, this whole thing that we're doing right now is basically for Michael Antonelli's benefit because he can't wait to hear about my experience. Fair. And I should, I should mention that it was, I had, I had an amazing time. Absolutely one of the best trips of my life. Uh, more importantly than me, the kids forget about it. I almost cried like watching their their joy. It was just, it was too much. Like, that's memories for, for a long time for you. Forever, yeah. So that's what you pay for. Speaking of, not to, not to put a downer in this, but some butthole uh, <laughs> uh, messaged me on Instagram or, or left a comment. Why would anyone in their right mind introduce their kids to Disney? So many better things to do with the time and money. I'm sure this person's very happy, right? Just, just a very happy, but- how do you keep your kids from Disney? What do you mean introduce? They have TV, dum yeah. dum. But would, here's the thing: would you would you be willing to go back next year already? Oh no 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 no! no. Right, that this no. is like a you check it off your list and you go like five years later, right? I, 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 or you're it, done. Like, I think I'm done. But if the kids wanted to go back in maybe ten years, which I don't, yeah. you know, but no, nah, I'm, I'm done. Uh, so anyway, so speaking of True Blood, Tara, Suki's best friend, was in The Last of Us. Yes. I, I, I did notice that, which, to be fair, has kind of tailed off a little bit. It uh, came out I, really strong. The last few episodes, I thought they need a big finisher because I thought last this this week's episode was eh, not okay, that great. I, I, yeah, okay, that's fair. Um, Robin and I got into a little bit of battle over my Tropical Bros attire. Did you wear it to the park? I had to be wore, great for Disney if it's well, warm. Exactly, because it was so hot. I wore it twice, and she she was like, "Listen, you want to be an idiot with Ben? That's that's <laughs> fine, but you are not wearing that to the park." <laughs> I, I won. I did wear it into the park. Uh, I noticed a lot of man fanny packs around the shoulder. Oh, okay. Didn't know that was a thing. Okay, Got to carry stuff, I guess. So I ate. So we went to a, a, like a buffet. And at the end of the buffet, they have like desserts, you know? And I grabbed a bread pudding. I think for the first time in my entire life. I said, yeah, give me that bread pudding. And I realized... Uh, I'm, I'm my dad because my dad's a bread pudding guy. Sooner or later, we all become our parents. And it's eating bread pudding at Disney made it, made it really official. Uh, did you, oh, you, did know you, you like, did you lose it at all? Did you like get really mad or impatient at any time? And did, like, this is, this is, I'm at my wits end. Did you have one of those oh, moments? Only, only one time. And it's funny you mentioned that because Morgan texted me. He said, I took my son to Disneyland for one day and I was exhausted. It took me two days to recover. Just trying to understand how you and Robin are seemingly going out day 77 and everyone looks happy. Right. It, Credit to Robin. She, it it, it yeah. was a lot. Um, oh, so it's this those places where you, you, if you have kids, you go to bed early. You get well, to so, home for the night and you're dead. So then Wednesday, we did half a day at the pool, back to Magic Kingdom. Thursday, we did Hollywood Studios. And on Friday, we just did a full pool day. And I said to Robin, if we were, I, I could not go back to the park on Friday. Right. I, I, I would have lost it. You but you know, when you, you know when you go on the ride? And they take a picture of you on the ride and you get to see it afterwards. Yeah. Robin spotted me, except it was a different bald guy. <laughs> she nice. was dying. We all look the same. Uh, all right. This is sort of random, but 
at the pool, I noticed something that had never occurred to me before. People who lie face down on a, on a lounge chair, what are they trying to do? What do you mean? Like, is the goal suck. just to burn the shit out of their back? Why would you want to tan your back? I don't even understand. Or is it just because they're trying to get a, a nap? Well, yeah, so you're even. So you're not just, if you just tan on the front, it'd be weird if you weren't tan on the back too, trying to even it up. Ah, see, my my uh, aversion to the sun, I, I never got that. Now it yeah. makes sense. All right, we're almost, we're almost done, Ben. Um, okay, there was like no Marvel presence in the parks at all, except for Guardians of the Galaxy. I'm guessing that is coming. I'm guessing there's going to be a big Marvel push soon. Yeah. Has to be coming. And I also thought, speaking of Marvel, maybe we'll get to that later. I feel like Marvel is like the perfect analogy for late stage capitalism. Just fucking done. Ant-Man <laughs> got slammed. Just completely okay. out of ideas. Nothing else going on. Well, after 45 movies, they had to run out of ideas eventually. So anyway, that was my experience with Disney. Uh, could not recommend it highly enough. I know it's not a scorching hot take, but really just an absolute joy. Top to bottom, start to finish. I'm and, not a Disney guy, and, and like the the memories we created there, or it was it was totally oh, worth God. it. Even though it, it seems like it, you're half the time you're going, are we really spending this? And you're like, you know what? Screw it. It's it's the memories. Got to do it. Uh, and then job. last last thing, how how insane was that Star Wars ride in in Hollywood Studios? The the rise of the resistance. My wife lost her phone on that. You know that the car's whipping around. Her phone fell out. And they uh -huh. had to go back and find it. And some guy randomly found it. Remember, you know, that, that ride, it, yeah, the amount of thought going into but when that they, was... But when they, when they take you off the ship and they bring you to all the stormtroopers... And they yell at you. My kids still yeah. talk about that, how they, they <laughs> are, their grandma, the, the guys, the stormtroopers yelled at her and they still think it's hilarious that the stormtroopers are yelling at them. Yeah, Incredible. That's good. All right, any good recommendations? Did you see Succession is done for good now after the season? Wait, I think I'm kind of, I'm okay with that. I'm um, great with that. Before we get to re recommendations, I just want to read this quick email that we got. Okay. Oh, I had to one. write it in to clarify something you inadvertently touched on during your brief tangent about actors' names. I believe that the Lee in Tommy Lee Jones is in fact a middle name, but there's a bigger backstory Boom. here. Credit point for Ben. The reason why some actors have middle names or middle initials is that SAG-AFTRA, the actors' union, requires all actors to register a professional name when they join the union. The union requires that those names be distinct from all of the other actors' names in order to avoid confusion. In practice, this is why you'll see middle names or middle initials in all references to some actors, especially ones who might have a relatively common first and last name combination, like Tommy Jones, hence Tommy Lee Jones. But there are many other examples, name a few. Samuel L. Jackson, Michael B. Jordan, Michael J. Fox. All right, we get it. Um, anyway, so uh, so I guess I guess I was Makes completely sense. wrong. Makes sense. I was completely wrong. Although Brian Austin Green is still a two-name last name. All right, Ben. So yeah, succession. Uh, I'm glad. I'm glad they they're going out on top. Credit to credit to. Yeah, so many other shows. Uh, Yellow, Yellowstone complete. Yellowstone is the horse where it looks really good at, in the front and like a cartoon drawing and the kids drawing in the back. Yeah, it just totally trailed off after the first three seasons. I'm happy with this. I watched the new Scream movie. I've been pretty watching good. movies while I while I arrived at the Peloton. It was pretty good. But pretty here's good. my here's, here's my one criticism. Our movies too self-aware these days because we went through the 80s when there was zero self-awareness 90s had a little self-awareness but were still like available to be kind of cheesy and now the movie was so meta it like there was talking about the original scream and like trying to figure out as people are getting killed like who's the killer and it was so meta that i think movies are too self-aware because of the internet these days like they they don't they want to be in the joke like wink wink we get it right I, I, yeah that's a good i thought it was effective though i thought it was a good movie yeah it, it i i the, the original Scream came out when I was in like eighth grade. And that was a big deal when it came was out. Was that 96? Yes. Incredible. It was a big deal. All yeah, right. that, that, that movie shook the world when it came out. I texted. So they had Sleepless in Seattle on um, the Rewatchables the other day. And I texted you this on Saturday night, I think, or Friday night. <laughs> My mom was in town watching the kids play some sports and stuff. And when I was growing up, I watched football and basketball with my dad, and I watched movies with my mom. And one of my mom's favorite movies of all time is Sleepless in Seattle. And I thought, why don't we rent this? for something to do. My mom and I watched Slips in Seattle, drank a little wine, and it really holds up still. Again, very cheesy, over the top, but is Tom Hanks the best yeller in movie history? When Tom Hanks yes. raises his voice in like in like a funny way though, like he him yelling is is just gets me every time. I don't know that I ever saw Slips in Seattle. I think I I think I might have gone to the theater with my dad to see it, but I can't quite Tom remember. Hanks and Meg Ryan both throwing like 101 miles Wait, an hour just What's the what's the other Tom Hanks Meg Ryan rom-com that came out around that time? You've got Oh, mail. you've got Mail. That's the one that we I saw. We actually watched that one this weekend too. Not as okay. good, but it's some okay. people still like it. Yeah. One more thing. 
Uh, I watched Primal Fear the other day. Did the 90s oh. use up all good movies' endings? So we have One Fight the- Club, Primal Fear, Usual Suspects, and Seven, all with like these fantastic twist endings. Did we use up all the good movie endings in the 90s? I feel like Primal Fear like showed me what a movie could be. Because I was like, I was, you know, that came out, we, I was young, right? But I was like, whoa. Yeah. Finally, I, we finished 1923. I'm doubling down on my take that this show was good. I, they had a story about like the son and his new wife getting home from Africa. And Is that I Harrison Ford? The whole, yeah, the whole show on just them. It was, I, it, there's a season two and I'm in for season two. I, I thought the first season was really good. Where do you, where do you I watch thought. it? Is it Paramount Plus? Paramount Plus. I don't think I have Paramount Plus. And What's I it? also kind of shrinking, I'm kind of out on. Okay. Really? I only saw th- just, two episodes. It was a little too corny for me. Okay. Yeah, it was cute. It was a little cute. So Harrison Ford's batting 50 50 for me. All right. What so do you got? I am very surprised with your honor. Are you watching it? I couldn't get into second season yet. Is it worth it? It's awesome. Really? Okay. Well, awesome it's might good. be a strong word. It. Because when after season one, I said I think I'm you know I, I liked it, but I think I'm done. I don't think I, I don't. Need, but it's it's good. Okay, I'm in. It's it's good. Yeah, right. it's uh it's good. Um, on the airplane on the way home, I was on an old JetBlue airplane, and they didn't have like where you could like pick the new movies. There was three options. It was uh, Wakanda Forever, uh, something I've never heard of, and the menu. So I rewatched the menu. It was even better the second time. Okay. I thought it was okay. It was even, yeah, so did I. I, I thought even better the second time. Um, all right, real quick, highest grossing films of 2023, even though Ant-Man, um, by all accounts, stunk, which is sad to me because I really liked the first two. Still did $120 million. Uh, uh, domestic, 350 worldwide or 360, which is, you know, not a bomb. How about Megan? How about, who, who went to see 80 for Brady? What even is that? I don't want to talk about it. Okay. So I did not see Cocaine Bear. And I probably, you know, a lot of people tagged me. I'm not in, I don't like, like Snakes on a Plane. That was not, I'm not into that where it's like too over. Listen, I mean, I'm obviously going to see Cocaine Bear at home, but I like Crawl. I like the Meg where it's not just a complete outright joke. Right. And March, I'm very looking forward to Listen to what what we've got coming up from March. We've got John Wick. I'm in for that. Scream. Definitely seeing that. It's in New York. Creed 3, yes, 65. So those are probably four visits to the theater for me. Murder Mystery 2, eh, first I one was kind of- I might see one of these movies, maybe. What about, what's Tetris? I don't How know. do they make a movie about, is that, is that the video game Tetris? Which of these are you going to say? 65 probably, maybe Scream. I'll watch the other Scream. And I might even watch Shazam. I like the first one. Okay. Anyway, this is kind of a depressing slate of movies. Nothing, yes. nothing new anymore. Okay. Late stage. All Long right. Long episode today, but we had to catch up. We had to catch up. Uh, animalspiritspod at gmail.com. Thank you for listening, and we'll see you next time.